Do you think, though, that ultimately it's a doctor's job to prescribe nutrition plans? And I mean, it, it feels like, you know, when, whenever I've had a medical emergency, I'm glad that I can go to a doctor and, you know, I, I'm not necessarily going in that moment for a long term diet and lifestyle plan. Right. I'm going for an intervention. Right. You know, right. Um, emergent care, for example. Yeah. So I just wonder if um, if that's a reasonable ask, you know, that doctors, you know, come out of medical school training as experts in nutrition, particularly in light of what we know about nutrition science, that so often it's weak, captured by the food industry and the like. Yeah, it's very corrupted. Mm. It's been traditionally corrupted science. And so when people say, we need more nutrition courses, I've <laughs> kind of been like, actually, maybe zero is better than more because... That's how I'm starting to feel. I mean, it's like we don't need more studies to... to elucidate the benefits of fruits and vegetables, meat, eggs, fish, things like that. It's amazing. Medicine is sort of rediscovering biblical principles, eating whole foods, eating clean meats, meditating. There's more mention of the word meditation in the New Testament than there is of prayer. Wow. Uh, fasting. I mean, these are like ancient concepts, right? Medicine's like, hey, new research that meditation before going to bed helps. <laughs> It's like, yeah, these are basic principles. So, yeah, I do think doctors have a duty. I understand the frustration. I think doctors come out of the system beat up, burn out, feeling like robots. They've been forced to memorize and regurgitate useless stuff on exams. Mm -hmm. And you were creating these people that are uh, lacking self-awareness sometimes. They don't can't see the forest from the trees, but they can tell something's missing. And that's what folks right now within our medical profession are reconnecting with. Not, you know, just, you know, the traditional system. You come in, you know, eat better, exercise more, avoid fat, you know, whatever misinformation we would tell people. Come back in six months, here's some pills. And then they come back and we're like, you're a bad, bad, non-compliant patient. <laughs> and it's like, this system sucks. Like, we, patients hate it. We hate being in it. Like, what are we doing? Mm. Like, st stop. This is obscene. And uh, we've never really thought about the whole person. We've never thought about food. It's been off the radar. It's, um, so it is the new revolution. It's one of the big frontiers in medicine right now. And the microbiome is part of that. You know, there are endless probiotics. So many, you don't even know what to take. And the, the ones that tend to be the most popular are just the ones with the best marketing. But pretty soon, research is going to be able to elucidate which strains of bacteria are the ones that you want to get in there, more anti-inflammatory, produce, you know, vitamins, GLP-1, whatever it is. And so we're starting to see research emerge on that. For now, I tell my uh, residents and trainees and medical students, don't fight it. Encourage it. Be open and humble. Tell people, I don't know. That's often the right answer. And maybe they could benefit from trying some different probiotics or whatever it is they'd like to try. If it's not going to hurt them, what's the downside of just saying, you know, I don't know, and do a little clinical trial and try to track whether or not it helps your abdominal pain or your energy level or whatever it is. Mm. And I think, you know, I didn't write about COVID in the book Blind Spots because it's too tribal and people are sick of it. But many times the right answer was we don't know. And you did not see that level of humility. And beyond the rush of making a recommendation, once the data were very clear on so many topics, months, years into it, you didn't see really any acknowledgement that, oh, you know, we feel bad, we got it wrong, telling teachers in the summer of 2020 to wear gla goggles mm. and gloves when they teach classes. Mm. Like, my feeling is, NIH and these medical oligarchs that control the research enterprise, they can do any study in weeks to answer any big question. Why aren't they doing it? They'd rather opine on TV and, you know, dilly dally. And, and the problem is we have a lot of things we do in medicine that are just dogma. We have an epidemic of medical dogma. I mean, heck, we were putting heart stents in for a generation in hundreds of thousands of people with the thought that we're making them live longer. And when the Courage research trial came out, it showed no increase in survival with heart stents outside of an acute coronary syndrome. Hmm. Now it can reduce the anginal pain symptoms, 
for people with angina. But all these people who got, got heart stents thinking, I'm going to live longer now. I'm good to go. Zero mm. survival benefit. So we need to do these studies early on. We've got this Bermuda Triangle. Just tell me if I'm talking too much because I, I get so passionate about no, this. No, I'm loving it, and I love the passion. Please keep, keep So there's this continue. thing called uh, tongue-tie surgery in newborns. Right. Kid gets born, and... My friends, their kid recently had that performed. Yes, it's it's soaring in the United States. It's uh, increasingly being done, a newborn's born. And... Uh, a doc or a dentist may do one of two things. Selectively figure out who has a foreshortened tongue and then release the frenulum under the tongue. Mm -hmm. Or routinely on every kid, they just believe that it's good for everybody. And they'll cut the frenulum under the tongue, sometimes the frenulum under the upper lip, which makes no sense to me. Even sometimes the side of the tongue on both sides. Now, here's a practice which may be barbaric based on dogma, there's no evidence, it's taking off like crazy. Maybe it should be done selectively, not on every kid. It desperately needs a randomized control trial to answer these questions, these claims that it helps with speech and sleep apnea later in childhood or, or it could increase breastfeeding rates. Some kids breastfeed less because they're in pain from the procedure. So this desperately needs a randomized control trial but it's in the Bermuda Triangle of research. Who's going to fund it? Pharma? <laughs> no way. Mm. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics? Fat chance. Uh, NIH? No research center for it. It's not kidney, you know, lung, heart. Um, and so this is where we need to change the way that we do research. We've got to focus on health and what people actually are asking about, not just what the NIH guys tell us to study. Hmm. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.